mm-hmm. I think it's it's uh, a fascinating film because it's such a specific milieu. So congratulations on on capturing something that we've never really seen in a movie for this particular community. So um, can can you talk a little bit about um, sort of the origins of that and, and figuring out that there was a world that could be captured here that we hadn't really seen before? Yeah, I think it's just, you know, watching television and films and not seeing your communities represented for so long. I don't know, it's like a very weird erasure that you don't realize is existing until you actually start seeing things that represent your communities. So like, for example, all of Sterling Harjo's work and reservation dogs and things like that, you're like, oh, whoa, I recognize those communities. I recognize those jokes. I recognize that world. Um, And you don't realize it's even missing until you get a taste of it. And I mean, for myself and Michiana, as we were developing and writing the script, I think we just wanted to really just tell a story about the people that we know, like the heroes in our lives, our aunties and our moms and all the queer folks that are working so hard in indigenous communities to keep us safe. That really this was um, born out of wanting to essentially write a love letter to those to those people. Michiana, what was the process like from a research standpoint? I mean, how much did you feel like you needed to know the intricate details of the world that was being portrayed here? You know, it's interesting because I didn't feel like we had to do much research for this. It's so much of our lived experience and our relatives' lived experience that it just came so organically. Probably the most research we had to do was on, like, how an ICE agent would behave, you know? Like, how the police would behave in this kind of situation. It was it was those outside things that really drew more, more of our research than the, the stuff with Jackson Rokey. That was just life experience. <laughs> okay, so Lily, how, how much of this, uh, you know, that we're talking about in terms of, you know, being able to capture a story that just hasn't been in, in movies before um, stood out to you when you first heard about the opportunity here? I mean, that's how I felt reading Erica's first, our first project together, Little Chief, which played at Sundance in 2020. So I knew she was developing this story before I read the script and I knew I was in anyway because Erica has that lens. I'm a difficult and always have been a bit of a difficult person to place until, you know, like Eric said, you don't really know what you're missing until you see it. It's like looking for roles is kind of the same for me. I'm not really sure where I fit, what kind of stories I want to tell unless until there's one that's just very specifically, yes, that. And usually it's looking places that people don't look typically. Seeing Jax and how she was shaped for the first time, knowing that there was basically the shape of her somewhere it was challenging, but it was familiar enough that it was like, it was a good push for me because Jax, Jax is not a victim, you know. This family is dealing with tremendous, like, loss, you know, and she knows that before Roki knows that, but aren't defeated by it, aren't kicking back in it. And I feel like a lot of, I don't know, I, I love seeing an actor thinking on screen and Erica writes scenes where you have the space to do that. Um, you don't have to be demonstrative of things, you just let the, it live in the world. And that, I mean, that invites people in in a way that it's hard to sell on paper necessarily. You know, keep bringing up res dogs, but I think one of the reasons that show is so successful and our film is so successful is for years we've been wanting to see stories come from our communities and we pitch them to people who like, well, a reservation seems so foreign to me and I'm not sure this is accessible for everybody and people aren't going to understand the cultural jokes and the little, it's like, but the way that you understand those things is by just being a fly on the wall and people are smart. I mean, that's the thing. Audiences are smart. They don't know what they want until they see it all the time. But when you see it, you just understand it. So Erica created this world in such a way that was gentle, but it wasn't letting anything off the hook. And it was just, um, yeah, it's it's refreshing. So Isabel, I mean, same question for you, just in terms of what, what opportunity did you see in getting involved in a project like this? I mean, this is my first feature, so. <laughs> and, Good start. Yeah, great start. Um, And for this to be my very first feature, it was just like such an incredible experience and working with everybody is always going to be my favorite thing ever. Mm. I don't think anything could top this. (laughs) But yeah, I just, I really, really care about the story. I care about Jackson Rokey and I just, I don't know, there's a lot of love there and I feel like that comes from everyone on 
who is on set and who has worked on this is just we all really, really care. And I feel like that comes through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and the other thing that's really fascinating about this movie is that it, it seems like it's playing with genre and different kinds of storytelling in a really interesting way. So I, I'm wondering, um, for the two of you, what, what kinds of films did you talk about? Uh, did you watch sort of to figure out like the vibe that you were going for? Yeah, it's definitely when we were writing the script, we had a lot of people say the same thing. Well, like, what genre is this? Like, I'm feeling like lots of different vibes from this. And I think we were just like, we have to stick to the truth of what this would be and what we see happening. And so we watched romantic comedies because there's like, there's like a romance that kind of exists between these characters or kind of like buddies, like buddy movies. Um, because they're very playful, there's heists, there's like hijinks where they get to have like a lot of fun with each other. But then, you know, like I'm a huge fan of Kelly Reichardt's films. That's where I first, you know, saw Lily's incredible face on the screen and, and, and you know, we watched Winter's Bone. So there was like really like a cross section of a lot of different kinds of films because, you know, we use humor and laughter to traverse um, difficult situations. And so we don't, it's not a thriller. It's not necessarily just a family drama. It's not a com you know, there's, we hope that, that because we kind of are cross to, like, covering all of this ground, <laughs> that what it means is that, that audiences get to experience the humanity of the situation versus us just picking one small moment and focusing in on that. Now, did you give your actors a list of movies to watch or? I mean, reading it, it was just Thelma and Louise was very oh, clear yeah. to me. I forgot that one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we definitely, definitely, Kelly Corey's script was a huge influence for yeah, us. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. having something that is a difficult story told through a very specific kind of genre, um, it's, it, you know, it really is the only thing that I could think of to reference as far as, you know, really driving toward the ending. We didn't drive off a cliff, but. <laughs> <laughs> And the other, the other thing that, that's really remarkable is that you're tapping into a story that I think if people do know about a situation like this, it's through the media, you know, st that when stories like this come out, you hear about them after the, you know, something really bad happens. And I wonder what your familiarity was with that. How do you feel about the way that these kinds of situations have been portrayed in the media to the extent that they're even, you know, picked up on? Yeah, it seems like, you know, Native American women who go missing or get murdered on reservations, they're they're kind of forgotten. And as an indigenous person to begin with, an indigenous person in America, you already feel forgotten. We've had comments multiple times where people have told us, you know, oh, I didn't even know that Native Americans were still around. Like, we're like you know, a, an American myth or something. So to have that be your existence as a baseline and then to have your death just be discounted or discarded, it's, it's just trauma on top of trauma. And so, I don't know, it, for me, it was like really important to have, like Erica was saying earlier, just be really truthful about how this affects our families and our everyday lives. We've had these questions where people have wondered, you know, how do you how do you carry on? How does Jax carry on through this story? And when her sister is missing, it's because we have to, because we've been left no other option, you know? So we find ways to laugh with each other. We find ways to keep our families together because that that's our survival. That's that's our connection. And we were never going to, from the very beginning, before we even put a pen to paper at all, we were never going to show a body. We were never going to talk about the specifics around any sort of death. We weren't interested in any sort of like um, poverty or trauma, porn. Like we were trying, we really were trying to be very mindful to not commodify that pain and suffering in any way. And so for us, it was like, we had a lot of conversations around certain scenes. We've lost things originally, because we were like, you know what? Like, we're not here to re-traumatize our communities. We're not here to put something so um, horrific in front of them. What we wanted to do was put Jax and Roki in front of our communities and say, you can see yourself in these two characters, meaning you can also get to the other side of whatever situation that you're dealing with. Um, and so, you know, we, we tried and hoped to have taken great care. For, for the actors, I, I'm curious how much of these kinds of situations were familiar to you when you 
heard about the project and what, what you got out of sort of being inside of a story like this as a result? I mean, I think our communities and our families are like either very intimately or still intimately, maybe not in your own household, affected by our kids not being raised by our own families, by our communities, by, you know, beautiful native people going missing and never being heard from again. You know, it's unfortunately, it's unfortunately a little too familiar. It's one of those things that because it's so familiar, you don't really place, I don't know, it's, you can't really place personal experience on it too much, but there is, you also can't escape that, so. Yeah, I mean, you kind of just, there's no like, oh, I'm figuring out, like I'm learning about this for the first time. It's kind of just something that's always there. It's like, it's a very difficult thing to kind of deal with. And I feel like the film really does it in such a beautiful way in talking about it. And, you know, Roki, she's growing up and she's gonna have to grow up without her mother there. And <laughs> I'm gonna cry, <laughs> but you know, that connection with the two of us, really, really strong. <laughs> Your other mother will be out in a few years. <laughs> I, I hope you're not crying in every interview and it's very specific to this moment. It's, it's, it's incredible to see that kind of reaction. I mean, it, the, the thing about the movie is that's, that's really striking is that it's a slow build. And when you get to that end, you really do feel it. And, you know, at the same time, um, when you have uh, when you work on a show like Reservation Dogs, it's fascinating to see how many different kinds of tones are possible to be told within this community. This, it's not just this one story, and I wonder how you what you're getting out of that, how it's affecting the kind of filmmaker you want to be and, and the stories you want to tell right now. You mean Res Dogs? Yeah, Res Dogs, and and also making this movie in tandem yeah. with that. Wow, I mean it's. I'm so thrilled to see all of Sterling's hard work and success really paying off. And he's been a mentor of mine for years, but like also just um, in awe of everyone else in, in the room and who's directed episodes. But like for me, it's, it's getting to work with these like incredible, talented people that I didn't know before. And just seeing how many like, yes, there's fancy dance, but there's also a bunch of other projects that are being written right now and that are being made right now in Indian country. And so for me, I'm just like so excited and thrilled for the success of our film, but also the success of all the other indigenous creatives that are out there making things right now. And truly, truly, for the, for the first time, people are writing checks. And it's not just us scrounging together $20,000 on a credit card or like, tr like we have studios backing us. We have budgets I mean, we this is not a this was not a large budget film by any means but it's bigger than what we would have had five definitely 10 years ago someone actually did write a check for us to make this film so for me i guess i'm a very kind of pessimistic person <laughs> in general um i'm feeling a lot of optimism right now and i'm hopeful that with the success of some of these projects that that just means that more creatives will have a chance to sit on this couch and talk to you about their really important and vital projects. Yeah, so Lily, as an extension of that, I can't not ask you about the Scorsese movie. And I, I saw another interview that you did. Where, I mean, it's impossible not to yeah. get into these things, right? You had mentioned that the community had a real impact on this film. And I, I would love to know why, because I think there, there are a lot of people are wondering, you know, with storytelling like this, you know, especially when it's not just indigenous people telling it, you know, what is the potential for people in front of the camera to really have an impact on how these stories are told? I think anytime you're in a, you're in a community that shares some of these communal traumas, these communal his, histories, you're really doing yourself and your story a disservice if you don't listen to who's there. And unfortunately, that's been the been the mo of people for a long time not just in the arts and anthropology and any kind of like let's go in and find out about the locals sense it's um it's an evolving conversation um it's really important when you have the locals and the people who are affected by it shaping it and telling you what to do like legit that's just kind of a lesson we should all be taking into these next generations it's let's not show up here and think, how can we reinvent the wheel so that it works for us? It's like, how can we contribute to maintaining what is already good about all of this? It's like with our film, 
the biggest obstacle that this family faces to our own joy is that outside force coming in. And my other film, same thing. It's like with this one, with that one, with a lot of stories about Native communities, like we don't need the saviors. We don't need, because really a lot of times it's more harm. Like realistically, if you're on the lens looking inside out, people coming in and loving what we've got and wanting to find some way to, to tap into that. Um, that affects our women, it affects our children, it affects our resources, it affects our ability to self-govern, it affects our ability to raise our kids to love themselves, but we don't have a problem doing that. It's those outside influences that get in the way. So maybe show up with a helpful spirit instead of in an open spirit and a, like, how can this benefit this? How can we benefit you by being here? How can our presence benefit you? And Isabel, as an extension of that, I mean, obviously the bar has been set high for you now, but as you listen to these kinds of conversations about representation and indigenous storytelling, how is it affecting the kind of career that, that you're hoping to have now that you've done one movie? I just want to do my best. <laughs> like, I, I'm just one person. I can't represent everyone. And I just, you know, with Roki, I see so much of my family in her. And so getting to see her story be told on screen and getting those stories that I'm so like connected to and close to is incredible. And I just hope that I can keep doing stuff like that. Just telling all the stories. <laughs> well, the last question for, for uh, you, Erica, is, uh, you know, it's, it's very unpredictable time for how movies get out in the world in general. Um, so it is fascinating that you're also working on a TV show, which is now, you know, developing a real following. But I'm curious about, you know, what what success for a movie like this looks like for you, you know, how, how you're hoping to go from Sundance to, to seeing it get out in the world. I probably should think about those things more. But what I try to do in any instance, you know, this is my first feature film. Um, I learned so much producing it. I learned so much like along the way, financing, figuring out how to like make the project exist and happen. And I feel very similarly about distribution and about like getting the project out and finding an audience um, is that you just find people that know more than you do <laughs> about those things and you bring them in and you find people that you trust and you let them lead the way. And, you know, we were, you know, connected. We, we have like a lot of people that are representing the film and that are taking it out and doing whatever magic they do in their meetings to sell the film or to find an audience for us. And I think in all of those conversations, I was upfront about what my expectations were from a cultural standpoint. I was like, I'm never charging my community, my Cayuga community to use this as a resource for language revitalization. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. And just finding that partner who's like, you know what, we, we believe in that. Let's find a pathway forward for you um, and for the film. But we're all here. It's a career. We're, it's a business. We want to make more of these, which means that we, we have to think about those things and find the purest way to stay true to our stories and um, find an audience. Like That's what you want to do as a filmmaker is find that audience.